So it is 11 o'clock sharp. Please beg my pardon. We're still going to wait for one more minute. Okay. Good day to all of you. It is great to have you for today's web meeting, dealing with the topic about biodiversity and food standards and sourcing rules of companies. Now, this session that we today have is one out of three web meetings that actually conclude the live food and biodiversity project. We're going to be here together today until 12.15. My name is Tobias Ludes. I do work for the Global Nature Fund and have been active in this project over the last four years. But today my role is to be a moderator. The goal of today's web meeting is on one hand side showcasing good examples of biodiversity management and procurement guidelines of food companies and standard systems. But more importantly, it is all about you. It is about the participants and to motivate you to kick jump or reinforce biodiversity protection in your own organization or company. Last time I checked, more than 110 participants registered. Right now, not as many are with us. But I'm looking forward to have a huge crowd of participants in the audience today. To those of you coming in a second later, welcome and thanks for being here today again. Please note that this web meeting is going to be recorded. And while we do like and love to have exchanges and discussions about biodiversity, I'm quite afraid that the amount of participants, as well as the time constraint, limits this possibility for today's web meeting. So you recognize that you are muted right from the start. This is not to have not a discussion, but we would rather encourage you to bring any comments, any questions, any remark that you have to the chat. The chat function itself, please open it on your right hand side in the WebEx matrix. In the situation that you use the chat and you type anything in, please make sure that your comment or question can be seen by all participants or everybody. I'm quite happy to announce that today, three experts will talk about their experience on biodiversity and how their organizations and company reinforce biodiversity and how they target it in future. You're going to hear Henriette Waltz, herself Global Theme Lead Biodiversity Conservation from Rainforest Alliance. She will talk about the future Rainforest Alliance standard and how biodiversity protected protection is taken up by this new standard. I'm proud to announce Union, the Union for Ethical Biotrade and here more specifically Simona D'Amico. Herself, monitoring and evaluation expert. She will talk also about the new ULBT standard, but more precisely about biodiversity action plans and hear about a case study in Europe. And summing it all up, it's going to be Andrea Schwalber from Nestle Germany, herself, sustainability manager. And she will dig into the topic what biodiversity nowadays and in future is going to mean for Nestle. 
while we know that you're going to have a lot of questions to those experts, again, I have to ask you for understanding that we cannot have an open discussion today. So there will be a question and answer session right after the PowerPoints or the presentations of each of the speakers. This would take, let's say, five minutes. And while the presenters present, feel free to ask your questions in the chat. Out of these many questions, I would then afterwards choose one or two questions and forward it to the speaker to be answered. Now, as you know how today is going to work, let me set the frame of where we come from or who we are that you actually listen to. Now, in 2016, the organizations of which you see the logos in front of you joined forces to start the EO Life Food and Biodiversity Project. In the EO Life Food and Biodiversity Project, the objective was to improve biodiversity performance of standards and labels in the food industry. Doing so by motivating standard organizations, food companies, retailers, to include biodiversity criteria criteria in their standard schemes and procurement guidelines. But having this in mind, we saw that we also needed to work on the understanding and knowledge on biodiversity. And importantly also, that we came along with a certain set of tools that actually support companies and standards in uh, actually implementing such criteria and monitoring them. Now, over the last four years, we have had pilot projects in all of Europe. We are right now in contact with over 50 companies and standards to actually work on this work field on these aspects to include biodiversity. We have had a look on thousands of biodiversity criteria and then communicated and collaborated with the private food sector to improve them. Now, all of this can be found in a lot of different um, documents, guidelines, and brochures. But here now, I would like to highlight the following one. We have set, we've collected with the standard and stakeholder dialogue, the most important criteria for biodiversity protection in a document that's called recommendations. Now, this one has been implemented two years ago, and we are quite happy in the team of the Food and Life Biodiversity Food Project that many of the recommendations given there are taken up at a broad range nowadays in standards and companies all over the world. Besides this, a lot of time has been spent on tools supporting those criteria and implementation, and also those tools were quite broadly implemented in the food sector. Now, all of this can be looked up and even more in our webpage, www.food-biodiversity.eu. And before we dig into today's meeting, you now know who we are, but we would like to understand who we are talking to. So right now, you see a poll popping up at your desk. Please answer it and tell us to which organization or company or to what you belong to. After answering, please make sure to press submit. And I'm very curious how today's audience is made up. Now, Martin, how is the result? Please come to an end to all attendees. Oh, wow, this is interesting. So a huge part of today's participants 
is from companies. It's great to have you. It's great to have you. But we also see associations. Now, this is the interesting part here. Yeah. Standards organization. Okay, very nice. Academia. NGOs and others. Okay, said. Thank you. This is a diverse set of the audience. Very nice. Um, let us understand how important biodiversity is already in your work. So for this, please shortly answer the following question. Okay, now I'm curious what the result says. Well, for me, obviously, it is quite important. And my colleague, Martin Hausmann, please display the result. Oh, wow. So we are talking to experts. Almost all of you are very much into the topic. This is perfect. This is perfect. So thank you for giving us this insight and understanding of your work already. Now, without further ado, I would very much like to actually welcome the first speaker of today which is Rainforest Alliance, and more precisely, Henriette Vibes, to introduce us to how you are going to target biodiversity in your future standards. Henriette, please feel free to share your screen and start the presentation. Good morning. You still have to enable me, I think, to share. Yes, it will be. One second. Yes, now. All right, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you, Tobias, for the introduction and invitation. Um, so I'm going to speak today about how biodiversity protection is targeted in the new Rainforest Alliance standard. Uh, just for those of you who don't know Rainforest Alliance, I'll give a short introduction. Um, the Rainforest Alliance is an international non-profit organization working at the intersection of business, agriculture and forests. Um, our vision is a world where people and nature thrive in harmony. And we have four intervention strategies. Um, the two uh, core strategies are certification, and that is why I'm here today, um, and landscape and community projects that we do to, yeah, um, to uh, deepen the impact or broaden the impact of uh, our work. Um, and then we have two support interventions, uh, which are advocacy on the one hand and tailored supply chain services on the other hand. Um, we work with partners and with market partners on more targeted projects um, and of course with NGO partners, etc., on advocacy. Um, the, um, our alliance is all about changing the way the world produces, sources, and consumes and the um, crops. The main crops that we focus on are cocoa, coffee, tea, bananas, forest products, and palm oil. Where with the certification program, program we focus on cocoa bananas, forest products, and palm oil. Um, we work through FSC and RSPO uh, certification. Here you see a map showing all the countries where you can find Rainforest Alliance or Oud certified farms. Uh, so those are 63 countries. And just a um, uh, quick word about Oods and Rainforest Alliance. Uh, probably most of you know uh, that Rainforest Alliance and Oots merged two and a half years ago in the beginning of 2018. And since then, 
uh, the, the two certification programs continue to run. So you still have OOTS and RA certified producers and production, um, although there's no OOTS organization anymore. Um, but, and since then, we have also been working on developing the new standard, which will replace the two existing ones. Um, and so we basically did a revision of the two standards to come to a new one that will become mandatory um, next year, 1st of July, and then um, we'll only have Rainforest Alliance certified producers. And now um, in the following, I will talk about how um, biodiversity conservation is um, tackled in this new standard. In, and I also want to mention that, of course, we had um, a lot of input um, from GNF and through the project, which was very useful in the revision. So, um, in the beginning or of the next session, I would like to stress again also how important biodiversity loss uh, is in global supply chains. Um, here on the left, you see the dependence on pollination of agriculture at the country level. Um, and um, yeah, I, uh, I find it always really important to say that also the tropical crops or um, also the global supply chains uh, depend so much on pollination. Um, here you see, for example, uh, Ivory Coast, uh, the biggest cocoa producer, very um, dependent on uh, pollination. And similarly, a recent study showed, uh, looked at different um, global crops and their dependence on pollination and showed that cocoa is one of the most vulnerable to pollinator decline. Um, and yeah, um, important to remember. Uh, of course, um, also uh, the impacts are very significant, as we all know. Habit um, here on the right, you see the Global Living Planet Index. Um, last week, the new one was published, but it doesn't look very different. Um, and in that report, there's also always, uh, of course, looks at the drivers and habitat loss due to deforestation and monocropping is, one, is the most important driver of this decline. For tropical crops, there's always an overlap with particularly critical ecosystems, of course, and um, also pesticide usage as the most as one of the most important impacts. So. How do we address biodiversity conservation? There are several criteria in the management, farming, and environmental chapter. So there's not really one criterion or one section. Um, they aim at preventing negative impacts as well as fostering positive ones. And I also want to say it's uh, we talk here about the standard, but of course the certification system also includes the assurance traceability system, um, and we support the implementation of the standard uh, through trainings and projects. And these are also really key points, and I'm also going to stress a bit on them in the following slides. So first of all, which are the most important points in the standard in the farming? Um, Practices part, of course, um, the most important topics are uh, pest management and soil fertility management. So there we have um, here in blue, you see the core requirements. I mean, the heading of the core requirements and then in green, the um, um, improvement topics. So for pest management, this is integrated pest management practices are implemented to prevent pests and reduce the use of agrochemicals. Um, so the um, yeah um, producers have to um, develop an IPM strategy um, with a um, knowledgeable or competent um, either employees or, or uh, advisor and then implement advanced uh, IPM practices and uh, record and um, report the use of pesticides and re uh, are used. On the other hand, producers implement measures to enhance soil fertility. So this is very much um, based on a soil assessment, soil and leaf test analysis, um, and then a soil management plan. Um, and then as an improvement uh, topic, optimizing the fertilizer use and also here, um, report recording and reporting fertilizer use and um, covering the soil. In the environmental chapter, the most important aspects um, I think are um, that producers um, don't 
encroach into forests or other natural ecosystems um, also not uh, are not located in protected areas and take measures in case they have a risk of um, yeah hurting high conservation values in the area then as uh, I think the most important Control point to foster positive outcomes is that producers are asked to maintain on farm natural vegetation and increase um, this to at least 10 or 15 percent, depending on whether they grow um, high tolerant crops or not. Um, yeah, uh, so um, increase this, um, the, the again report record record the level of natural vegetation on their farm and then increase this um, at least to 10 15 percent also producers are asked to maintain repairing buffers so um, natural vegetation buffers around um, aquatic ecosystems and uh, as improvement establish and restore them where they are not uh, existing within three years um, and then last but not least, that producers take measures to protect endangered species and native flora and fauna and minimize human wildlife conflicts. How is this different than from previous standards? Um, of course, the Woods and RA standards already aim to conserve and protect biodiversity. Um, there are a few changes, but I think more importantly are the changes um, on the assurance uh, system um, and the the yeah the implementation of the standard, so the um, um, first of all uh, the deforestation um, and protected area control points will be uh, support the implementation or and assurance will be supported by an automatic risk assessment so the farm location points that are shared within the certification program. Um, are analyzed uh, for their deforestation risks um, with, with reference to um, a, a forest map, which is either a tailor-made forest map or um, a land cover map, um, and tree cover loss. Uh, and then the, both the group um, and the auditor have to take into account this information, um, yeah, either address or um, particularly visit risky producers during the audit uh, and similarly for uh, protected areas. Then um, in the uh, for HCVs there's a risk assessment asked um, where producers uh, have to assess um, the proximity to indications of presence of HCVs so such as key biodiversity areas and intact forest landscapes and if there um, is an indication of proximity to HCVs, um, then they have to implement additional measures. Um, and last but not least, um, I already touched upon this, but the new standard includes a lot more indicators that the producers, the certified or the cer certificate holders have to collect data on. So for example, for natural vegetation, cover, um, the certificate holder has to record how much natural vegetation cover is there and then report this and show improvements at least to this minimum. And similarly for pesticide and fertilizer use. So in addition, we um, work on projects. Um, uh, for example, um, within the LIFE project, we were in collaboration with the Global Nature Fund and Fundacion Omedales in Colombia on uh, coffee production. So we um, adapted um, the biodiversity action um, plan tool to coffee uh, in Colombia and implemented it with three pilot farms, so quite big coffee farms in Colombia and here. And they all in, improved their performance um, here. And on the bottom, you see the example of one of the farms. And um, yeah, we really appreciated this uh, very practical tool um, the, or very practical to demonstrate improvement on biodiversity and to, to um, facilitate the, the 
choice of measures and the implementation of measures by the farmer. So we definitely also want to continue working with that to uh, support the implementation of our standard. And I would like to um, end with um, one example of uh, impacts here also in Colombia in an impact report um, showed that 47 uh, percent of non-certified farms planted trees outside of coffee farms um, and 75 percent of certified farms. Um, yeah, thank you uh, uh, and uh, looking forward to the questions. Oh, great you, Henriette. That has been truly interesting. Rainforest Alliance is one of the main global standard systems. Um, there have been a few questions, and I would very much like to forward them to you. The first one was from Sabine Valens. How do you at Rainforest Alliance manage pests exactly? Could you dig into this a bit more deep? So I'm not, uh, I haven't worked on the farming chapter, so I would um, in that case also uh, be happy to forward this. Um, but there is, so uh, the way it works is that certificate uh, holders, of course, this is a very um, local topic, which exactly, which practices exactly you, uh, you um, should or, or could do. Um, so the, the, the way it works is that they, uh, that certificate holders are asked to uh, develop an IPM strategy, and there is a guidance document um, of the Rainforest Alliance um, on on how to develop an IPM strategy or what what to do ex at least for uh, getting RA certification. And there are also a number of practices outlined, um, and uh, certificate holders have to. Um, show that they um, use at least some of these practices. Uh, what is mandatory, for example, mandatory improvement uh, topic also very, um, uh, there, there are different also mandatory uh, things to do. But for example, one is to enhance natural ecosystems around production areas. Uh, so for example, um, yeah, planting particular particular flowering species that attract beneficial insects um, or the like. So the very related to this session, um, this is, for example, one of the practices that uh, we require. But I'm also happy to forward uh, your request to the um, RPM expert. Mm -hmm. Yes. So in that case. Mrs. Valens, um, please feel free to contact us after this presentation so that we can make up the contact with Rainforest Alliance. So, Henriette, if you promise to answer quickly, I would like to forward another question to you. From Susanne Schlömers, how do you handle biodiversity risk in the supply chain? Um... I'm not really sure I understand exactly the question. Um, we don't have any um, mandatory requirements, for example, in the supply chain um, standard, which is the chain of custody standard. Um, I mean, it's uh, always, of course, uh, the the approach should be to do a risk assessment to look at the crops, um, the uh the production areas how um yeah how um i guess the main uh, like what the main risks are uh deforestation etc um and also looking at the vulnerabilities um yeah i'm um entirely no, sure how it. to is that <laughs> i guess yeah. we will talk yeah. about this in the in the other presentations as well yeah, we can we can see whether we target these aspects later in any of the other presentations. Um, thank you still for your answer, and thank also for the participants for your questions. Now, this is the moment that we actually switch from Rainforest Alliance to the Union of Ethical Biotrade. And for the Union of Ethical Biotrade, it's going to be Simona D'Amico telling us 
how their actually new standard, which has just recently been launched, addresses biodiversity. And more precisely, the Union of Ethical Biotrades implemented something that was a recommendation out of the Food and Biodiversity Project. They implemented a biodiversity action plan into their new standard system. But how this looks like is something that Simona elaborates about. Thank you, Tobias, for inviting. Thank you for this introduction and good morning, everyone. And uh, I'm happy indeed to share uh, with you our approach to biodiversity. So I think uh, you should be able to see my screen right now, correct? Yes, we see it. Okay, so then I can start. Um, so indeed, uh, today I'm going to introduce you the biodiversity requirement in the new UVT standard and uh, how we use the biodiversity action plan as a tool to facilitate uh, compliance. I will also show a concrete uh, case uh, in the citrus. Uh, production in um, in Europe. But before going to, to the core, let's say, of this uh, presentation, please allow me a few uh, slides on what is uh, UVT uh, for those who um, do, does, uh, do not know us. So uh, we are a, a non-profit uh, association whose mission, is, whose vision is um, uh, to work for a world in which people and biodiversity thrive. Um, we were born in uh, 2007 with the support of the United Nations and actually the idea was uh, to uh, have UBT uh, promoting the implementation of biotrade principles um, uh, through the work of uh, companies in the pharmaceutical, cosmetic and uh, food sector. I will detail later on what the biotrade principles are, but in general the idea was that UBT would promote the implementation of practices that are good for biodiversity and for people when sourcing uh, botanicals or other um, plant and uh, the, uh, derivate from uh, plant. And uh, to do so, uh, UBT uh, has three areas of uh, work. One of it is to raise awareness among business about what are crucial topic when uh, wanting to promote biodiversity and uh, um, uh, local development. We also uh, verify and certify uh, companies who implement the um, biotrade principle, and also we provide a tool and technical uh, assistance um, to um, member and non-member companies who want to um, implement those uh, principles. Our focus is uh, uh, on specialty ingredient. What does it mean? As you see from this slide, we work mostly with uh, plants and their parts. So we talk about flowers, seeds, fruit, and all um, those uh, ingredients that are used mostly in the cosmetic, uh, pharmaceutical and uh, herbal tea um, sector. Um, right now we have um, a members company, so a company who joined the UBT and uh, implement the UBT uh, standard in 16. More, uh, more than 60 countries, almost 70 countries around the world, and uh, almost 60 uh, companies uh, who, that are members to UBT. And those companies, uh, they work with more than two, 200 ingredients and more than 700 uh, supply chain. Uh, this is just a, a snapshot, let's say, a summary of uh, some member of UBT, of course not comprehensive, but this is just to give you an idea that we work basically with companies at different uh, stages of the supply chain. So we have a brand like Natura and Veleda, but we also work with um, uh, companies, let's say, in other stages of the supply chain that do uh, primary processing or secondary uh, processing of uh, um, uh, ingredient from uh, uh, from nature and we uh, cover the herbal tea sector but food and cosmetic companies are also uh, in there we have also partnership 
uh, with the organization working uh, um, to promote biodiversity, access and benefit sharing, and uh, local development. And among them, you see in this slide that uh, there is Global Nature Fund. And indeed, with the Global Nature Fund, we have worked uh, on uh, the Life, Food and Biodiversity Project. Um, uh, and through this collaboration, we have developed the, the guideline for uh, the setup and implementation of biodiversity action plan um, uh, for in, in, uh, in farming. From this. Um, uh, start, so this this guideline became, let's say, our um, the backbone of um, uh, other development that we made. After this, we also developed an online training on the uh, definition and implementation of biodiversity action plan, and we have also adapted those guidelines to wild collection because actually I forgot to say, but we work with both uh, cultivation and uh, wild collection, and all these uh, indeed be became the, the structure on which we also have developed our um, um, new standard. Indeed, as uh, Rainforest Alliance, uh, we have uh, just issued uh, in July 2020, we published the new standard that will uh, enter into force and will be um, mandatory since uh, next year, so July 2021. The standard, as I was mentioning before, is built on seven principles, so the ethical biotrade principle. Two of them concern biodiversity, so sustainable use of biodiversity and conservation of biodiversity, and I will uh, zoom in. Um, in the coming slide, but also we have a principle uh, concerning respect for people. And here there are all the requirements around uh, fair and equitable sharing of benefit, uh, socio promotion of socioeconomic sustainability along the supply chain, um, compliance with the legislation, but also respect the right of actor in the supply chain and, and, uh, and similar. But uh, Let's go uh, indeed to the, um, the, the the core of this uh, talk, which is about the, um, the, the, the the requirement for biodiversity in the UBT standard. As I said, we have two principles on this topic, and for each principle, we have several requirements that, of course, I couldn't present one by one. So what I will do, uh, I will give you a sort of overview to explain you, let's say, the, the approach we have. So, for conservation of biodiversity, basically we mean all those actions that go um, and look into the uh, promotion of uh, biodiversity. So, protection of uh, ecosystem and habitat, uh, promotion of um, uh, certain species, also beyond the farming and uh, wild collection um, activities. And uh, the approach is built on three uh, key steps. So the first requirement or set of requirements is about uh, assessing the situation of uh, biodiversity in the uh, farm and collection field, but also in the surrounding. So basically identify the main threats to biodiversity, the key opportunities, or if there are plant, project, or uh, species, or habitat that are protected, and what are the initiatives that are working on this. Then, based on the result of this assessment, the other set of requirement is about taking action for biodiversity. What does it mean? Uh, we provide some example of action around the protection of ecosystem and habitat, so creation of buffer zone or similar things. Also, creation of priority areas for biodiversity. So, for instance, set aside the area um, in, a, uh, in a farming field, for instance, is one example. And then um, also uh, other example of action to be taken are around the promotion of habitat connectivity. So, especially in those uh, contexts where the issue is habitat fragmentation, how you can use, I don't know, um, um, strips, uh, uh, vegetation, vegetative strips and similar to promote uh, connectivity. And then the third key, uh, the third uh, set of requirement is around monitoring of those actions. So uh, um, 
uh, set up a system to be able to uh, assess your uh, target. So if you are achieving your target and your impact and adjust actions where uh, needed. The other uh, set of uh, requirements for biodiversity are uh, under the umbrella of uh, principle two. Uh, where it is a sustainable use of biodiversity. Here we mean basically all those actions that can be taken in the, in the field. So while uh, producing, like while farming your crops or while har harvesting from um, and the wild, um, there are some requirements on practices to be followed to be sure that biodiversity is uh, um, uh, protected or uh, restored. And the, the approach is exactly as I have explained before. So the first set of requirement is about having information on the collection and cultivation site. So be sure that you know the location of your site, what are the characteristics of the crops or the wild collected species, what are the key uh, wild collection and cultivation practices, and also be able to um, identify the main issue that may concern biodiversity in your field. Then take action. Uh, for sustainable use of biodiversity. And here there is overlap with also what uh, Henriette was uh, saying, because indeed we have a uh, requirement around the minimizing the use, the, the use of agrochemicals, so with integrated pest management as an example, um, and uh, doing uh, soil and water um, management, so to ensure good uh, soil and water condition, promote also climate resilience, um, of uh, your farming or collection practices, improve energy efficiency, reduce waste um, and contamination deriving uh, from it. And also, sorry, the first point was about sustainable use of crop, wild collected species and interdependent species. And for each point, we have an example of action and requirement. Finally, the last step is to monitor. Um, indeed, the implementation of your action and be sure you are getting to your, uh, you're reaching your target or adjust the, the action when uh, needed. Um, so, how then biodiversity, where biodiversity action plan uh, come in? They come in because we recommend it as an approach that facilitates basically the, implement, the, the, the fulfillment of those requirements. And how? Because the biodiversity action plan, according to the way also we have structured with the Global Nature Fund, has got five uh, key steps. And uh, those steps basically they overlap with the approach that I have just explained of assessing the situation identify and implement action and then monitor your, your action. So the first step of the biodiversity action plan is conduct a baseline assessment. And here we have, for instance, a template with all key aspects that uh, are in line with our requirement, with our standard to be assessed. Then we have the step of setting goals and target, defining measures to reach those goal and target, and also define a clear work plan on when you are going to do what. And this is, um, this is also another set of tools template that are um, uh, structured in a way that uh, they overlap with the, 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 the requirement of our standard on the action to be taken for sustainable use and conservation. And then the monitoring system is the last um, uh, step. And um, here it's indeed the requirement on the monitoring of the action. So you see with this, we have created the, the link and we, use the, we recommend the use of biodiversity action plan as a way to fulfill our um, uh, requirement. But let's see, and this is my last slide, basically how this has uh, worked um, uh, in practice in one um, supply chain of uh, citrus. And um, so we had one member company 
um, who indeed was interested, like was actually required to implement uh, biodiversity action, and uh, and they were working with the production of uh, citrus in southern Italy. And uh, what we did first, also we uh, supported them, and the company also had an intern an, an agronomist that also could implement the work, and uh, we also uh, and provide the technical support to farmers and we also interacted a lot with the local university. And the first thing we did was uh, to guide the company in implementing a baseline assessment. And this is what the company did. And they identified, identified some key issue for uh, biodiversity uh, that they needed to tackle. So the first issue was about uh, changing climatological conditions, so an increase in the amount of uh, rain and therefore a spread of uh, pest, and then also a tendency to use um, uh, chemicals, so pesticide to combat the pest, something that was new uh, in this uh, sector. Um, so basically the idea was that the traditional irrigation practices were not suitable anymore, so they needed to be changed, and also some action needed to be taken, like the promotion of beneficial flora and fauna, so that beneficial insects could be brought back to the um, uh, to the field to, um, uh, to, to basically to uh, to reduce the the pest. And another point that uh, emerged was that around the farm field, there were some uh, protected areas. And so another action would be also to contribute uh, to, 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 to the management of those areas. So indeed, the company set then uh, uh, together with the, the farmers they worked with, they set some uh, goals. Uh, for action. So one of these was to repopulate uh, pollinators and other beneficial insects by setting aside um, areas in the farm and also creating flowering strips. And uh, uh, also they defined an integrated pest management system and all the farmers have been trained on this integrated pest management system to um, implement it. Then um, also they uh, wanted to uh, promote some native vegetation in, uh, in the farm, vegetation that was also important and protected in the protected area close by. And mostly they re-implanted some trees that they also used as a border uh, to uh, as a windbreaker. So all actions that promote biodiversity, but at the same time are functional uh, to uh, the the management of uh, the farms. So this is just basically how I would like to end my presentation and I hope this gave you an understanding of how everything uh, come, um, comes uh, together. And uh, But still I'm very happy to answer your uh, questions if um, uh, any. Well, thank you, Simona. This has been really interesting. Biodiversity exoplanets being rolled out globally. This is really great news, um, also for our project. Now, so far, there have no questions been raised, but for all the attendees and participants, in case you still have questions, please contact us after this presentation, and we'll make sure to make up the contact with Simona. Oh, well, there is one. Uh, please, Simona, a very short answer to the question that comes from Nuno Samento. Hi, Nuno. Do you, as UBT, use citizen science tools um, and global biodiversity databases for monitoring? Uh, the citizen science tool, uh, no, we uh, don't uh, use. 
uh, from the, the uh, but we do uh, rely on or at least also recommend the use of uh, some um, uh, database on biodiversity, for instance, for the uh, mapping of protected areas or around the world or uh, of other key biodiversity areas. We use also we recommend also the use of this database uh, that have all the list of uh, protected endangered species. Uh, um, what else? Uh, we also use other database for um, uh, the in, in, for uh, for the tracing of invasive species and so on and so forth. And uh, we have a sort of compiled list of those database. And uh, yeah, we do recommend the use to our uh, member when they need to do their uh, assessment. And yeah, this is basically, and we use it uh, ourselves also when uh, we need to to check some uh, aspect. Oh, thank you. Uh, thanks for this answer and for this presentation, Simona. As I said, very interesting. And having a closer look at the time, I would very much like to invite Andrea Schwalbe from Nestle Germany to introduce you how your company, Nestle, is targeting the aspect of biodiversity now and also in future. Oh yeah, this works great. Yeah. Okay, so you can see my presentation, hopefully. Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Wonderful. So, uh, yeah, welcome to everyone. Um, um, I'm working as a sustainability manager for Nestle Germany. So, and uh, I will now. Oh, have to. Sorry. Uh, switch to my first slide. So I give you uh, will give you an impression uh, how Nestle um, is implementing or um, including the topic of biodiversity in his uh, new responsible sourcing standard and um, also in the responsible sourcing program um, for uh, vegetable raw materials. So, but first of all, um, I want to show you in, in which frame, in which uh, context we act as, as a company. So, um, I think you all know that the uh, situation in Germany is, is uh, very special compared to, to other countries. So, we have a lot of many uh, in the last years, uh, many food scandals. We have uh, very active NGOs and a big pressure uh, from the press uh, against uh, uh, food companies. And all these at the end, uh, uh, yeah, led to to uh, a big loss uh, in trust uh, on trust in the food industry. So also the uh, consumer is in between, in the middle of this uh, th situation, and they also lost trust uh, uh, in the um, big food companies. And um, that's, I think, also the reason why the consumer looks for for. Um, other solutions. So um, also um, the last studies, um, one one you can see here from the GFK um, shows that uh, topics regarding sustainability and health uh, are becoming more and more important for the consumer. Um, also in the last um, consumer goods study, um, you can't find res a result that five, 55 um, percent of the consumers want more information, more transparent information um, uh, about their products uh, regarding sustainability, social uh, topics, um, health topics. So uh, they, at the end, they want uh, product transparency. They want to know from where their raw materials are coming, uh, how the raw materials are cultivated. and. This is exactly the, the, the context um, um, in which uh, Nestle is acting and um, also the new, new topics like climate change and biodiversity. Uh, these two topics are very high on, on our uh, global agenda, but also on the overall um, agenda of everyone. And um, 
So Nestle, um, for Nestle, um, not only the climate pledge is, is, is very important, also uh, the commitment to, to biodiversity. So uh, we know that the preservation of biodiversity is a central concern um, for Nestle because um, as biodiversity is an essential base for, for sustainable agriculture and for the food production. So um, to take in account all these uh, points, um, the decision was made that uh, we have to rework, to review uh, our um, existing documents because um, uh, the uh, in the context of responsible sourcing, so responsible sourcing, sustainable sourcing become more and more important for the also for the consumer. Um, we have to take in, uh, into account uh, the important topics like biodiversity or water management. So uh, a working group reviewed the uh, uh, existing document and developed together with NGOs the new responsible sourcing standards, which covers now social topics, but also environmental topics. So um, um, you will find now, um, I think, all these social issues like labor um, requirements, health and safety requirements, but also ethics and business relationships. But on the other side, and that's an important and new thing, um, they uh, integrated also environmental topics like uh, uh, biodiversity, because biodiversity as a very important um, topic became a, um, their own chapter. So, uh, for example, um, each supplier um, has now to develop a biodiversity action plan um, for uh, for his farmers, for his farms, and um, also topics like animal welfare or um, pesticide management, water management. Now, find uh, a way into the uh, responsible sourcing standard. And um, this standard is now uh, contains all behaviors and requirements we as Nestle expect from our suppliers. So, um, and that's exactly in, uh, on the slide, you can see how we, or how is our understanding of responsible sourcing at Nestle. So we have um, these uh, explained responsible sourcing standard which is a base for all suppliers, all tier one suppliers. So, and um, via audits, um, we will check, we are uh, third party uh, audits, we will check uh, our direct suppliers if they are implementing uh, the requirements from the responsible sourcing standard. But uh, to give the consumer total response, um, traceability and uh, transparency back to the farm, we have also to, um, have a look um, into taking account the upstream supply chain back to the field. So for this, we, we implemented um, for our 15 uh, high risk raw materials, like for example, cocoa, coffee, palm oil, um, specific um, sustainability programs. Uh, we are also together with uh, partners, like for example, the Sustainable Agriculture Network, uh, we uh, find out uh, the traceability. So um, we want to check the traceability. We want to get more information about the whole supply chain back to the field and to the farm. We also, in our programs, and um, the program I want to um, explain to you um, is the vegetable program. Um, we also do farm assessment because we have to do something directly on the field. So, but what about our responsible sourcing uh, program for vegetables? Um, as I already mentioned, uh, we have sustainability program for the big raw materials like coffee, cocoa, so uh, which are covered uh, from uh, by by global sustainability programs. But the Nestle Germany, we want also to purchase locally sourced uh, raw materials according defined social and uh, environmental. Um, criteria, and that's exactly the reason why also, uh, already in 2013 um, we uh, had a look on the most important vegetable raw materials based on the on the purchase uh, volume. Um, so and to evaluate, uh, and uh, we also did hotspot analysis to find out which are the biggest one, which are the important uh, vegetable raw materials, um, and then. 
as a following action, we uh, started a pilot project with a um, with tomato raw materials, because the tomato for the German uh, market is the biggest vegetable raw material. And it's a very uh, important raw material also for our brands, Maggi, food brands like Maggi or Wagner. So, and um, together with our biggest supplier in, in Spain, for tomato in Spain, um, in the region, from the region um, Extremadura, Dura, uh, and also um, the NGO, Fundación Global Natur, um, we, we, we started this pilot project. We, we did uh, assessments at farm level um, and workshops together with farmers um, to develop concrete actions uh, for the following year, for the following years. So, and measures, um, for example, because biodiversity was a very important topic in this case, measures um, like, for example, uh, implementing of flyer stripes for pollinators, but also uh, planting uh, complex tree rows uh, to prevent soil erosion uh, were impl implemented on the fields in Spain. So uh, one year later, uh, we rolled out um, this uh, pilot project also to um, Italian tomato suppliers. And also there we started together with, with um, suppliers and farmers pilot projects. So and then in the end, all these key findings and all these learnings we we generated um, from these projects were integrated into, into a responsible sourcing guideline for vegetables because we wanted to go further. We, we, we wanted to, to um, follow, up, follow up and to scale up this initiative in a real responsible sourcing program. And uh, in the following years, um, from started with a pilot project, with an initiative from the German market. Now the program, the responsible sourcing program for vegetables was rolled out globally and is now led by our responsible sourcing colleagues um, in Verve um, at the center. And um, actually it's, it's reviewed. So, but what about our responsible sourcing program for for vegetables? So, so what is our vision, and what what want uh, what want we um, do we want to 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 achieve with this program? Um, for sure, the vision is uh, to ensure uh, respect the the ethical standards to to do reduce. Um, uh, the impact of agricultural practices on the environment and also to, to improve biodiversity within our uh, vegetable supply chain. So what you... Okay. Okay. Hopefully you can see this. Um, what you will see here now is... Um, the structure of our, our responsible sourcing program for vegetables. Uh, we have three main pillars um, in the program. So we have uh, traceability at the beginning. So that's the first step. Uh, compliance, creative shared values. So And of course, um, we, we start with traceability. So on the, the traceability part is um, uh, the main purpose of this part is to collect information about the whole supply chain back to the farm. So, uh, and in this case, to improve at the end the trans uh, transparency uh, to the vegetables origins. So each supplier in scope has to fulfill uh, this this uh, point because it's mandatory. This step of the program is mandatory for all suppliers in scope, meaning um, for each year we defined uh, vegetable raw materials which are in scope because we, we want to roll up to scale up the program stepwise. Um, next level was uh, to ensure compliance on the field level. So, and here um, the purpose is to, to encourage our suppliers to undergo third party audits and assessments uh, at the end to meet our ethical standard at a farm level, but also at the processing plant level. So, and for sure, if, if there are findings uh, within the audits and the assessments, uh, the supplier um, 
prepare has to prepare an action plan to close these gaps uh, and at the end to demonstrate continuous improvement. Um, the third also compl as a compliance pillar is mandatory for all suppliers in scope. Um, so and then we have a third pillar. It's a um, created shared value pillar and this pillar is voluntary. So here the, the suppliers have the chance together with their farmers to go beyond compliance and uh, to implement um, improvement plans, action plans uh, with the, the uh, the overarching goal to enhance at the end biodiversity and come to a better agriculture. Um, all these activities which are implemented or which are developed um, uh, are supported by Nestle through funds and also to, through technical support. So we work together in the pro whole program process together with two um, partners. One is the Sustainable Agriculture Network. Uh, who is helping us uh, with the whole pillar of traceability and the whole traceability process. Uh, and we also work together with the Fundación Global Nature and also the Global Nature Fund um, if it comes to created share value projects. So within the created share value projects, we have a specific focus area. If a supplier decided to uh, participate on this created share value part of the program, um, it's mandatory that he is doing something, he's developing something uh, regarding biodiversity. Um, and uh, also uh, something regarding uh, improvement uh, of ag agricultural practices. So my main focus area we'll see on the next, you will see on the next chart. So um, here we have nutrient management, soil conservation, water management. And all these, the improvement plan is always based on the annual assessments um, of farm agricultural practices. So you can see where are the gaps, where are the um, um, improvement areas to define a very concrete uh, action plan. So um, to give you, to show you uh, what we already done and uh, a small impression of our best practices. Uh, so, and what we what we did at the end on the field. So we'll see, uh, you will see here three, three uh, uh, projects, one, uh, two tomato projects, one in Spain, one in Italy, and one carrot project we just started um, in um, Germany. So, and you'll see, um, uh, focus is all, always biodiversity. Biodiversity is so installing a good biodiversity infrastructure uh, besides the fields, on the field, is always uh, uh, the main topic. Uh, and uh, then depend on the on the assessments, you have uh, measures like, like uh, um, water management. For example, in Spain, uh, we implement uh, dripping lines uh, to, to uh, reduce the water use usage, uh, but also um, topics like planting winter crops, cover crops is, is an important thing. Um, in uh, also in Emilia Romana, um, you see um, here we have conducting regular plant tissue analysis can be one of the, of the measures we, we do. Yeah. Please excuse me, you are running out of time. Oh, okay. So that's, that's my last chat. <laughs> yes, thank yeah, you. It's fine, fine like that. Thank you. Well, thanks for this very nice presentation. Um, Nestle is a big company and it's really nice to see that you're going towards biodiversity. There has been a few questions <laughs> and having a close look at the time once more, Andrea, please try to answer crisply. Um, there is one question. How do you actually define tier one suppliers at Nestle? So, sorry again. The, the question it says, how do you define tier one suppliers? How do we define? Oh, yeah, it's what, what is tier one suppliers for you? So who's going to deal? Need to all, deal all the direct those? suppliers, all the direct suppliers. All direct suppliers. All direct suppliers, yes. Okay, okay. And then there's a second question. This second question asks, 
how should the topic of biodiversity be tackled for dairy production? What? Okay, I think this is several questions actually. Let's stick with, with the first one. Do you already work on the field of biodiversity in dairy production? Yes, as I have informed right, yes, but not yet in Germany. Not yet in Germany, globally, yes. Globally, yes, okay, thank you. Now this person has actually typed in a few questions. Let me go for the next one, and this is going to be the last one. What actions is Nesta taking to combat deforestation? Oh, we have a, we have a de deforestation commitment. Um, that we don't want by by the end of this year, we don't want ha to have deforestation in our supply chain. And um, we have this satellite program to to monitor on to to uh, track uh, the situation uh, in the in the uh, cultivation regions from where we uh, get our raw materials. But oh, okay. I think we we should go deeper in this because. Uh, to, to answer this question very very quick is, is difficult. So please please contact me uh, via email so so I can give more information about that. Yeah, this is a very kind offer of you. And um, from our side, thanks once more for your presentation. And we also thanks for the questions being raised. It has been a very nice overview in the activities of some of the organizations and companies that actually also work in the Life Food and Biodiversity Project. Now, I would ask my colleague to give me the presentation rights for a last slide to share. And as I stated earlier, the end of this session does not mean come to the end of discussions or to come to the end of questions. We were limited somehow by the time, but it does not mean that you cannot reach out to us and ask questions that are still on your mind. Now to do so, we actually prepared, uh, we actually prepared, let me see, can you see the slides that I display right now? We prepared a poll, a very short questionnaire that we would be happy to reach out to you and we would like to ask you to answer. My colleague is sharing this link in the chat right now. But before you go and answer this, it takes just two minutes, let me have the final word on today's section. I would like to close this web meeting with looking into the future. We've seen that there is ambitious projects going on and we would like to encourage you to step up similarly with your organization or company and to encourage you, motivate you to take on biodiversity. There has a lot of experience been shared with you. There is a lot of information available. There's no need for anybody to start from scratch. There is tools available and feel free to reach out to us because most of the things are free of charge. Now, looking into the coming weeks, there are gonna be two more sessions about the EU Life Food and Biodiversity Project. I would like to introduce you that there's gonna be a second session about national initiatives of the food sector that actually target biodiversity. And rest assured, UBT, Rainforest Alliance, and Nestle Germany, they are all part of the German initiative on biodiversity. We're going to be introduced to even more than that. And finally, the session three, which is at the end of this month, it's going to deal a bit more about tools that have been developed over the last three years. And precisely, or more indeed, it's going to talk about the biodiversity performance tool. Also, a very interesting topic, a huge one. So therefore, we need to have another session on that. So with this, I'm out for today. We wish you a great working day, a great week, and please answer the poll and see you then at the 22nd. Goodbye. Thank you.